This is Domenico Composto with Easynomics, and today we're going to look at the kinked demand curve uh, to illustrate tacit collusion or informal collusion uh, between oligopolistic firms or duopolistic firms. So let's go ahead and take just a, a few notes regarding um, this market structure. So with oligopolies, let me take my, my black pen. With oligopolies, uh, and we can also use this for duopolies. Um, here we're going to illustrate the idea of tacit collusion. which is another way of saying informal collusion. So here we have oligopolistic firms that are not formally meeting to set price or quantity. In oligopoly, there's just a few dominant firms, and as a result, they can spot and see each other, and they keep an eye on each other in terms of price or other non-price uh, factors that their competitors might be doing to grab market share. So we're looking at tacit collusion or informal collusion between oligopolistic or duopolistic firms where they are uh, making an informal agreement, in this case regarding maintaining price at a particular uh, at a particular price. In order for this to work, there has to be some type of price leadership. There has to be a leader in the industry that the other oligopolistic firms will follow. So there's a dominant firm in the industry, in most cases, that might set price and the other firms will follow that price. The other firms will match or follow that, that price. or follow that particular price, okay? Or, or follow some other um, characteristic that the dominant firm is, is setting for the industry. And we're gonna use an example that where that will be very uh, apparent, All right? We're gonna talk about Coke and Pepsi as an example of informal collusion. So let's go ahead and draw the kink demand curve and with the kink demand curve, we're illustrating the idea of non-collusive oligopolies that are setting a similar price. Right? These are non-collusive oligopolies that have a very similar price. Okay, And this gets into the idea of a sticky price that's found in many oligopolistic um, industries. Okay, so we're looking at the kinked demand curve. This is what we're going to illustrate. So let's go ahead and begin to draw this. We'll be measuring quantity of output at Q1. And on the y axis, we'll be measuring price costs of production, and revenue. Okay. And let's just get rid of some of these notes. And we're going to be looking at the market for soft drinks. Okay, so let's look at the market for soft drinks. So we're going to be looking at two firms to keep this simple. So it's a duopoly. You're looking at firm A, which we'll say is Coke. And we'll be looking at firm B, which is Pepsi. Okay. Now we'll notice that with Coke and Pepsi, they have a very similar price. So we'll label that P1. And we'll draw this perfectly elastic line um, and we'll just say that one can of Coke is both priced at $1 a can by both duopolistic firms. 
So Coke, as the market leader, we're going to assume that Coke is the dominant firm. They're the market leader. And Pepsi will follow the decisions of Coke. Coke has established price at P1, and Pepsi has matched that price. And so they're both selling their cans of Coke at $1 and competing in everything else except for price. So they're really engaging in the non-price determinants to get their demand curve to increase, to increase their total revenue. But Coke wants to do more. So Coke's thinking, uh, Coke's thinking, can we find another way other than the non-price determinants to increase our total revenue. And they think, what would happen if we raised price above P1? What would happen if we increased price above $1? What would potentially happen to our revenue? And in addition, what would Pepsi do? Because we have a level of strategic interdependence between these two firms. So Coke's thinking, if we raise price, what would Pepsi do? And rationally, Pepsi would maintain price at P1. If, so if Coke raises price, Pepsi will maintain price at P1 because Pepsi will become the cheaper substitute and they will be able to grab market share from Coke. So that doesn't sound like a good idea. Coke realizes that if we raise price, Pepsi will maintain price at P1. Pepsi will become the cheaper substitute. They will grab market share and Coke's total revenue will fall. So essentially, the demand curve for Coke would be very elastic. Okay. Elastic because if Coke raises price above P, uh, P1, their total revenue will fall because they will give, um, their customers will flock to the cheaper substitute of Pepsi. Okay, so that's not a great idea. So Coke's thinking, what if we lower price below P1? What would potentially uh, happen with Pepsi? If Coke lowers price, Pepsi's not just gonna stand there and allow Coke to become the cheaper substitute. Pepsi would also lower price to match Coke, and that would set off a price war. Both duopolies lowering price, matching each other's lowered price to grab each other's market share by becoming the cheaper substitute, but as they lower price, they will be reducing total revenue, so that is also a bad idea. So Coke realizes if they lower price, their demand curve would be very inelastic. D1 equals AR1, which is equal to our marginal benefit. Okay, and that's because, again, since they would be, ha they would be facing a, a, an elastic demand curve, the lowered price total revenue would fall. So the moral of the story is Coke would just maintain price at P1 because raising or lowering price would lead to reduced total revenue. And Pepsi realizes this also. Pepsi would also not want to raise or lower price because the same thing would happen to them. So both Coke and Pepsi will maintain price at P1 and instead they will compete in non-price determinants of demand to shift their demand curve outward. So they're gonna compete in um, the quality of the product in the uh, in their advertising, in their marketing, in acquiring um, celebrities to sponsor their drink in the hopes that that would increase their demand curve. So here we have a, you know, an understanding of why prices are sticky between non-colluding oligopolies. But we're not done. We still have uh, a few more things to graph here. So let's just get rid of some of these notes and finish this model, okay? And to help us, I'm just gonna draw a line from this point down to help me with uh, drawing my model, okay? So we're gonna look at Coke, Coke being red. We'll imagine that Coke's supply curve Coke supply curve, let's assume, is here. S1 equals the marginal costs of production for Coke. Actually, uh, Coke, since it's the dominant firm, let me change that. Since it's the dominant firm, it probably has larger economies of scale. So it probably have lower costs of production. 
So uh, let's make that Pepsi instead and cope with the lower costs. So let's do Pepsi first. Okay, so here's Pepsi. There's their supply curve. That'll be S1 equal to marginal cost one. And this will be for firm B. Just making note to ourselves that that's firm B. And since Coke has larger economies of scale, they've been able to reduce their cost production. They will have significantly lower, uh, a lower marginal cost curve. So here is S2 for Coke with marginal costs at C2. I'm just making a mental note that we're talking about firm A or Coke. Now we need to include their marginal revenue curves. So we're gonna assume that they're gonna place where MR equals MC. So this is our demand curve or our average revenue curve. And here is Pepsi's marginal revenue curve and it's intersecting where MR equals MC. And then from that point on, the marginal revenue curve becomes fairly inelastic. And then we'll illustrate Coke's marginal revenue curve coming down, intersecting where MR equals MC because that is profit maximization. And then from that point, it becomes fairly inelastic. There is MR2, okay? So here we have the marginal revenue curve for uh, Pepsi and the marginal revenue curve for um, Coke, right? I apologize that it's not beautifully drawn. Perhaps I can improve that just slightly. No, that's not gonna work. So let me just get rid of that. There we go. We'll just leave it like that. All right. So we have pretty much finished drawing this. Um, in some of your economics books, they will show this represents slightly differently. But as a student, you will better understand uh, this model by representing the MR curves and the MC curves for both firms. So let me go ahead and analyze this model as you would on an IB paper exam. All right. So here we go. As can be seen, we have a, a model illustrating the kinked demand curve, which uh, we would ex which explains the sticky price between oligopolistic or duopolistic non-colluding firms. Okay, non-colluding firms. On the x-axis, we're measuring quantity. On the y-axis, we're measuring price, costs, and revenue. And we'll notice that both uh, firm A and firm B have a similar demand curve represented by D1, which is equal to average revenue one, which is equal to the marginal benefit one. Okay. We'll also notice that both firms have different costs of production. So firm B, Cost of production is represented by the supply curve, S1, which is equal to marginal cost one. And firm A, being the dominant firm with larger economies of scale, has lower cost of production, which is represented by their supply curve at S2, which is equal to the marginal cost two. We'll be assuming that both firms will profit maximize, profit maximization, occurring will, where MR equals MC. And we see the marginal revenue curve, MR1, equal to the MC1 at a particular point that sets quantity at Q1. And for firm A, they'll produce where MR equals MC. So we see where MR2 equals MC2, it sets output at Q1. Firm B will follow firm A since firm A is the dominant firm. And firm A will establish price at P1, and Pepsi will match that price at P1. Now, firm A would like to increase their revenue, and firm A is deciding whether or not they should change price to increase the total revenue. And they are thinking that if they raise price above P1, what would their competitor, firm B, do? And firm B would not raise price they would maintain price at P1 to become the cheaper substitute and grab market share. So firm A realizes that if they raise price above P1, their total revenue would fall, thus their demand curve would be very elastic. 
firm, firm A then decides what if we lowered price below P1, what would firm B do? And firm B would match their lower price. That would start a price war. And as they fight with each other by matching each other's lowered price, they would find that their total revenue would be decreasing. So as they lowered price below P1, their total revenue would decrease, thus making their demand curve very inelastic. As a result, firm A decides not to raise or lower price, but to maintain price at P1, thus establishing a sticky price between um, a sticky price, which would be expected in non-colluding oligopolies or duopolies. All right, so that is our analysis. Hopefully the kink demand curve makes a little bit more sense. And just to illustrate what some of your textbooks might show, your textbooks might not show all of this. Right? Your textbook might actually show the following. I'm just gonna illustrate what you might be seeing um, in your textbook. So um, many of your textbooks would eliminate this second MR curve here. And here, and you would only see the second MR curve um, at this point. And they would also be eliminating uh, this portion of the MR1 curve. Okay. And we'll just fill in. Oh. Yeah, that's fine. So your textbook actually would you'd be showing something like this, and you'd have an MR curve that'd be coming down, intersecting with the higher marginal cost curve, then showing you the range of the cost of production for the various firms in this. Uh, industry, and then showing you the margin revenue curve with the firm with the lowest costs of production. So many textbooks would have this purple line represented, and this is what confuses many students, but if we go back and you illustrate that additional portion of the margin revenue curve, MR1 and MR2, you'll see what has been deleted um, from your textbook's representation of this model. Okay. And that's it. Thank you so much. Please like, subscribe, and comment. And uh, that's it. Thanks for your time.